Well, good morning again, everybody. Happy Jesus' birthday, and I'm glad you're here to celebrate the birth of Christ. Um, also, I just wanted to add, I want to thank Edie and our whole church. That was an unexpected gift, and this is the season of giving. And thank you so much for, and I'm going to try not to cry, too. But um, it's the Holy Spirit that puts that inside of all of us. And so thank you for the gift, and we so appreciate it. Because what would we be without Christ? And he's done so much for us, so we thank you so much for that. Um, this... <laughs> Thank you. This is our prayer book. And Chris had mentioned that some of the churches might not be open this morning. But if, if you have a phone or a computer and you can get on Facebook, we invite you to join our church live because we are having service today. And we have in this book a list of names that are people that need prayer. And it's not a prayer request book, but it's a book of names and we plan on filling this up and filling up another book and another book and if you send your name to rock and country church and give us an address where we can send this we we will send you a rock and country church is praying for me sticker that you can put anywhere on your car refrigerator to remind you that god loves you and that this little church which is not going to be little for long Amen. is praying for you so Gentlemen, if you'll remove your hats, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this glorious day. Thank you, God, for sending your son to this dying world that we can have life in you. I just want to lift up all the other churches in this area, Lord, that you will give, give them what they need, Lord. And we also just pray for our community, that you will strengthen our community coming into the new year that we will put you first in all that we do. Lord, we also want to pray for our state uh, and all for our country and the whole world, Lord, that you will just give, give wisdom to our leaders that are leading this country, Lord, and help them make decisions that only you are at the bottom of, Lord, because we can only be in the right direction when we follow you. Lord, I ask that you put your hand over our offerings this morning. Bless it to be used according to your glory. And we ask, oh, and also for Pastor Woody's message to, to be what everyone needs to hear this morning and that it can go out all into the world. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey, good morning, Rockin' Country Church. And again, happy Jesus' birthday. I love saying that to people. But a lot of the people, they go, what? But I just, I love doing it that way in, in uh, that's what God put on my heart a long time ago to, instead of saying Merry Christmas, because, you know, everybody went to Happy Holidays. What's that? That has no meaning to me. I don't know if it has a meaning to you or not, but to me it doesn't. So uh, when I say Happy Jesus Birthday, yeah, I think you know what I'm talking about. Amen? You better believe it. You better believe it. There's a couple little announcements that I want to uh, talk about today is number one is, as you can see, we have moved the uh, chariot over there and we've got the tub exposed so we have a baptism today amen 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 now it is a water baptism which is her proclamation to you and I that uh, uh, what she has already done and received in her heart which is Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior so our sister Crystal is going to be baptized today with her water baptism also we have again our prayer vigil today we know that prayer works and so we're going to uh, have our little prayer vigil it won't last very long please stay if you can we would love to uh, for you to do that uh, because we know that prayer works we are a praying church uh, we've pray time and time again and we're going to pray another time okay actually before we're done today we'll probably pray about three or four more times so uh, with that though let's go ahead and pray up our children's ministry and we're going to dismiss the kiddos they'll go back and uh, get the message that miss terry has got for them today and uh, we'll get on with our teaching heavenly father we thank you for this day we thank you lord for each and every day we thank you lord for the breath of life itself we especially thank you, Lord, for the breath, the breath of heaven, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Father, be with us today. Open up our minds, hearts, souls, and spirits so that we may receive your word as you would have us to receive it, Lord. Let us come to know the love that you have uh, for us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. All right, so let's go ahead and dismiss the kiddos.
Now, on the, uh, well, we don't have it on the screen yet, but uh, our scripture today is going to come from the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. So in your Bibles, go ahead and go to uh, Matthew 1 and, and uh, Luke 1. Matthew 1 and Luke 1. Now, I thought I was going to do the traditional, if you will, uh, Mary and Joseph story. Uh, but God kind of put something a little bit different on my heart today. A lot of times when we go grow up in our societies, we don't get the correct message of the birth of Jesus. And so... I think this is all from Scripture that we're going to, and we're going to have a lot of Scripture today. Not that you're going to flip back and forth or anything. It's just going to be, a, a, I'm going to share with you what I and what the Lord has put on my heart is as best the chronological order of the birth of Jesus that I can do according to Scripture. All right? Because I'm not using anything else from anybody else or, or it's just out of Scripture. So we're going to go from Matthew 1 to Luke and then Luke to Matthew, that kind of a thing. But it's all in Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1, 2, and 3. So it's going to be very, very easy. Go ahead and find those. If you've got a couple of markers, mark uh, Matthew 1 and uh, Luke 1, and it'll be very simple to keep up. But uh, a lot of times when we hear the story and we sing the songs, we don't get at the true order of the the coming of Christ into our world. We've all seen the Christmas story, right? Remember the, the movie, The Christmas Story? You're going to shoot your eye out. You don't get a BB gun. Well, just like that story is just a story today, I want to share with you the true story of the meaning of Christmas, the true Christmas story. And so I'm going to uh, do as best I can to share it according to Scripture in the chronological order that it actually happened in. So we're going to start first with Matthew 1, and we're going to flip real quick. You don't have to flip there to Luke 1, but I'm going to share with you and tell you why uh, right, so go God has put this on my heart to share with you. In <laughs> Matthew 1, blue. we're going to look at the genealogy of we Christ in just one verse, down, verse 6. Oh, no, I Okay, and it says, and Jesse you. begot yeah, David the king. David the king begot down. Solomon by her who was <laughs> Bathsheba, <laughs> whom had been the wife of Uriah. <laughs> now, I just want to stop there for a second because we also need to understand over right, in Luke 3 and 31, right, we see also King David begot a gentleman by the name of Nathan. A gentleman by the name of Nathan. Now, the purpose of knowing okay, this is that Solomon is in the lineage. He is in the king, kingly, the royal lineage, which leads to Christ. But this genealogy also leads to Joseph. Right? You can see it at the end of the genealogy. If we look over in uh, Luke, we see that Nathan is also a son of King David. And so through the blood of King David, Mary comes. Come so irregardless of whether you say, well, Joseph wasn't Jesus' real father, so how can he be the king of kings, Lord of lords? It's because of the blood that also came from King David from Nathan, who was the son, brother of Solomon. And if you follow that genealogy, it will take you to Mary. So irregardless of whether you consider it being Mary or whether you consider it being Joseph, it is the royal lineage and it is the bloodline of King David, just as prophesied in the Old Testament. Now we're going to start today with Matthew 1 and 18. Matthew 1 and 18. This is a narrative. This is a narrative of the birth of Jesus. And we're going to go over and look into a more detailed version, if you will, over in the book of Luke. Now the reason that we're going to do that is because simply this. In some of the Gospels, you read some things, and then you don't find it in other Gospels, right? It's very common. It's very, very common. Why? Because the writer, when they wrote this, they says, well, this is how the Holy Spirit is telling me to write it. And then another writer is saying, this is how the Holy Spirit tells him, telling me to write it. And so, therefore, God put this together so that we will say, well, why is this one not here and it's not here? It's so that we will read the whole Bible. How simple is that? Oh, well, I read the, the, about the birth of Jesus, so I know all there is. 
Well, not if you don't read the other scriptures. So you see, God doesn't want you to just take one scripture and say, oh, well, this is what it says. This is the Bible right here. Let's look at Genesis 1.1. In the beginning. Oh, well, I, there it is right there. I know the whole Bible. God was in the beginning. Well, last night we had our, our candlelight service, and we looked at in the beginning, God was. In the beginning, Jesus was. In the beginning, the Holy Spirit was. Before anything else was, God was. The triune God was before anything else. And then we learned also in John 1.1 1, 1, that Jesus is the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And also that Jesus is the light. Also, Jesus is the life. We had about 40-so people here last night, and it was, a, I thought, a pretty good service. I hope it was. I hope it was very informative to understand that we are here, just like John the Baptist is here, we are here as a testimony to the light, that light being Christ Jesus. Okay, you are to take that light inside of you, the light of Christ that lives in you. You are to take that light and go out and share it to the world. Make known to the world Jesus, Jesus, not you, but Jesus who lives in you. Because it said over in John 1 that he is the light for all men. For all men. If I don't, if I don't go to William and share the light, how will William ever know about Christ? Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. If I don't go out to Robert and show Robert the light of Christ living in me, how is Robert ever going to know Christ? Now, it should be the other way around because Robert knows a whole lot more than I do. But do you see what I'm saying? You are the testimony of Jesus. And you need to go out and be that light for all of mankind. Don't take it. Jesus uses this as a scenario of you don't take a candle and light it and put it underneath the table, do you? No, because then nobody can see so you put the light on the table so that all can see. That's what we're supposed to do with the light of Christ that's, that lives inside of us. So in Matthew here, we're going to do a narrative of the birth of, of Jesus. And then we're going to go over to uh, uh, Luke. And it's actually in Luke 2. And we're going to see a more detailed scenario or, or story of the birth of Christ. Now, I hope... You can just bear with me and follow along. I don't want you to be bored, so try to use your imagination as we go, okay? All right. Verse 18, Matthew 1 and 18. Now, now the birth of Jesus <clears throat> was as follows. After his mother Mary, had, who was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Now, just to let you know, and I've done some research on this, and you may be astounded, and you may not. Mary was believed to be anywhere from 12 to 15 years old. Now, this is the custom of the time it's certainly not our custom today, but Joseph was believed to be anywhere from about 25 up to, I read in one place, 80 years old. I knew you would go, what? You must understand, and this still happens today, in that culture, in that culture, elderly men, if you will, took younger brides. So, we like to think of it more like, oh, she was 15 and he was 17. Well, we don't really know other than the fact, and it's not so much that important, other than the fact that we must know that she is declared a virgin. So as that culture would, would uh, show us, a virgin was probably up to the maximum age of 15. So she was somewhere between the ages of 12 and 15, and it was not uncommon for a child bride of a lady to be 12 years old and then consummate her marriage at the age of 13. Now, to us, that is totally unheard of. However, we don't live in that culture. We didn't live 2,000 years ago. So the whole point of this is so that you understand the real story of Christmas. This is part of it. This is part of that culture. Now, I would hate to think that Joseph was 80 years old, but it is presumed that probably he was in his 40s somewhere. 
but I'm going to keep him at 17 because I just like that story better, okay? It sounds better morally, but again, that's that culture. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, was not wanting to make a public example of her, was minded to put her away secretly. In other words, he loved her so much, irregardless of their age, he loved her so much that he didn't want anybody to know that she, had, she was pregnant. Why? Because if she was unwed and pregnant, guess what would happen to her? She would be stoned to death. We'd have never have had the birth of Christ because she would have been killed because she cheated on her husband, to put it in simple terms. So he loved her so much. And we have to understand, Joseph was a pretty awesome guy to sit there and say, uh, wait a minute. We're not, we haven't, we've never been together, and yet you're going to have a baby? I don't think so. But that wasn't Joseph's attitude. Joseph's attitude was, I don't understand this, but I have a love for you that is, that is an enormous love, that is an undying love. It's the love that only comes from God, a begotten love from God. Agape love from God. A love that only God can put in a person because we as a grown man, if we had a daughter who was 12 years old, we wouldn't stone her to death, but don't you think she would catch a little uh, few words? Sure we would. But Joseph loved Mary. And though he did not understand this, he did not want any harm to come to her. This is the love we should have for one another. But while he thought about these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in, in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. You see, God always lays it out for us when we need to know. When we need to know what we need to know, God is there. And he laid it out for Joseph. He says, it is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you will call him the name Jesus. You will call him the name Jesus. In Hebrew, it is Yahshua. In English, it is Joshua. But Jesus means Savior, or saved by God, or God saves. A very appropriate name for our Lord and Savior, Jesus. You should call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all of this was done that it might fulfill what was spoken of the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. God with us. That's Isaiah 7 and 14, prophesied by Isaiah. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him to, and took, her, took to him his wife and did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. That's a narrative. That's very, very simple and, and easy to understand. The Holy Spirit came upon Mary, impregnated her, and told her that she will be named, she will name her son Jesus. And then the, another name for Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God with us, in order to fulfill the prophecy of the Old Testament. So see, this as we spoke a couple of weeks ago, as I spoke a couple of weeks ago, this was planned way back when. It's nothing new. God has a plan, and God has a plan for your life and for my life. But as Joseph, and as we should do, we have to listen to the Lord and then follow his instructions, whether we understand it or not. Whether we understand it or not. Let's go over to Luke, Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Now, again, I'm going to try to keep this in a chronological order, so we're actually going to go 2 through 31 through 35. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out to Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. All the world should be registered. 
Oh, wow. Well, why did they do that? Anybody here got a Social Security card? Guess what? You're registered. Okay? It's nothing new. The census first took place when Quirinius, or however you say his name, was governor of Syria. He was actually governor twice. <clears throat> so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up to, from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. This was to fulfill Micah 5 and 2. Because he was of the house and the lineage of King David, which I shared with you earlier. Now, from Galilee to Nazareth, uh, to, uh, from Nazareth, which is in Galilee, to Bethlehem, is about a 70-mile walk. Mary is pregnant. Ladies, only you can relate to this. How would you like to have to ride a donkey if you will, for 70 miles while you are with child. You'd probably have it on the way, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, she didn't. She had to go to the, uh, to the city of David in order to fulfill what is prophesied in Micah 5 and 2. Verse, uh, verse 5. They went to the, to the uh, city of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was, and while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. <clears throat> and she brought forth the first son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room at the end. Now, most of you know this. If you've been coming here for a long, long time, uh, you certainly know this because uh, we use this every, every year. Swaddling clothes is not clothes it is wrappings it is rags she did not have they did not have because they were they were very of, of eager means and so they took rags that they could scrape together and wrapped him up in rags and laid him in a manger now Jesus was not born in a manger Jesus was born basically in a stable it was a carved out stable in a cave it was a place where the farm animals were kept out of the weather. And a manger is a feed trough. It is a stone feed trough carved out of a stone. And that's where they put the animals' food in order for the animals to eat and not have to eat off the ground. Now, the scenario or the symbolism of this is, is that we can go to God's feed trough any time and every time we need some nourishment. In other words, we can go to the Bible every time we need to be nourished by the Word of God. We can go to the feed trough. We can go to the manger. And we can feed on this. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. So he is our food. And any time we need nourishment, we can go to the bread of life. Verse 8. Now they were there in the same country, the, the shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over the flock at night. And behold, the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the lone sh Lord shone around them. And they were greatly afraid. If, if angels appeared to you, would you not be shocked? Would you not be sitting there going, oh my gosh, what is this? Well, certainly you would be, and so would we, so would we all. But behold, the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of God shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. How many times does Jesus tell us throughout Scripture, Do not fear, do not be afraid. When God comes, you don't need to fear him. You will know when God comes into your life. Do not fear him. Do not worry about it. Do not be afraid. Just accept him. Just accept him. Then the angel Lord said to them, Do not be afraid, and behold, I bring you good tidings and great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you, there is born to you and to me, this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. God did not send his angel to the kings of the world. 
He did not send his angels to the rulers of the world. He did not send his angels to the governors or the presidents or the rich people of the world. He sent his angels to the most meager people in the world. So whenever we come to Christ, we think, oh, well, why would God ever come and talk with me? Why would God ever, ever come and visit with me? Why? Because you are important to him. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how much money you got. It doesn't matter who you, uh, what kind of status you have. God wants you. And he will come to you. Just like he came to these, the, the shepherds were considered the lowest of lowest of low people. The bottom of the pit, if you will. But God came to them to show us God wants everyone. Absolutely everyone. And he will come to you if you just open your eyes and welcome him. He is there. For there is born to you this day the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you you find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there, wa there was with the angels a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace. And on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. Now, most people take this scripture here and they said, Oh, well, God says that there will be peace on earth. That's not what God says. God says in peace towards the men of the earth. In other words, there is now peace through the Savior, through the Savior and the Savior alone. There is now peace between man and God, not men and men. Have we done without war since Christ came? No, we've had wars every year. Every day there's wars going on. There's a major one going over in Europe right now. Scripture does not say peace on earth. There is never going to be, I hate to bust your bubble, but there's never going to be peace on earth. Throughout the entire history of the world, supposedly there is only like 270 days without a war going on. Throughout the entire history of the earth, only around 270 days where there has not been a war. Now these are not consecutive days either. There will be wars throughout history all the way up until the time that Christ comes back in the, after, the millenn after his, his millennial reign because there will be some wars during then. There will be battles going on then. Satan will be, re be released, remember, at the end of his millennial reign. But when the kingdom age comes, there will still be sin on the earth until Christ cleanses the earth then there will be no more sin. Then the new Jerusalem shall come down. The new heaven, the new earth. And it will be put back as God intended it to be in the book of Genesis when he created the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was a perfect place for man to live. And man messed it up. But it's coming back. It's coming back. Verse 15. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. If you heard directly from the Lord, if the Lord said, Jenny, I don't want you to drive for FedEx anymore because you're missing church. Oh, did I hear that? I'm just teasing away, you know. But I'm simply saying this is that if God speaks to you, if you're truly in tune to God, you will know his voice when you hear it. You will know it. Oh, well, I don't think I've ever heard his voice. Then you don't know it. Then you don't know it. But if God speaks to you, would you not listen? Sure you would. If everyone in here has been saved, I'm going to put it that way because it's very simple to understand, then you have actually heard the voice of God. Because no one comes to God unless you are called by God. So you have heard the voice of God. Now you may not have heard it since because a lot of people in the church, is, this is the church's fault, a lot of people say, oh, well, I'm saved now so I can live like hell. I can do whatever I want to do. And that is not true. That is not true. 
The church should be teaching that whenever you are changed, when you are renewed, when you become that new person, that new creature, that new creation, when you are reborn. I talked about this over in John 3 the last uh, several weeks. When you are reborn, there must be a sign. There must be a change in you. If there's not a change in you, you're probably not reborn. If you're not reborn, guess what? You're not saved. Now, I'm not passing judgment. That's not my point. But if there's not a change in you, then you are probably not saved. But if there is a change in you, and what is that change? I desire to do the will of God. Not my will, but his will be done. Jesus spoke that in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, Father, if this cup can pass for me, then let it be. Not my will, but your will be done. See, whenever you seek out the will of God for your life, then there's been a change. There's been a change. Now, that's between you and God. No one is your judge except God and you. But if God spoke to you, I think you'd be listening, right? You better believe it. Verse 16. And they came with haste. That means they hurried up and got there to see this, this thing that they had been told about by God. They came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which is told them concerning the child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. In other words, who went out and went to preaching. How simple is that? In other words, they went out to share the light of Christ. They went out to, to evangelize. This is exactly what you and I are called to do. You're not going to go out and save anybody. You don't save. God saves. But you are gone. You are to go out and share Christ with people. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Now, your moms, can, your moms can relate to this. When you had your children, and when now that you have probably grandchildren and such, and you hear people come up and they say, oh, what a sweet child you have. Then you just feel all warm and fuzzy inside, right? Dads, we do too. When, when somebody says, oh, you've got such an awesome child. Dads, we feel all warm and fuzzy inside too because we, we, we think, wow, that's mine. That's a gift that God gave me. And it's a gift that the world sees. Mary felt the exact same way. She didn't say, oh yeah, that's mine. Y'all can't have him, he's all mine. No, Mary says, wow, how blessed I am to have this child. There's a song that you can read. It's called the Song of Mary of how she appreciated so much what God had given her. Unbeknownst to her what a Christ child was, she didn't know what it was. She just know, knew that the Holy Spirit came upon her and impregnated her and God spoke to her and said, you will have, you are blessed among women and you shall have my son. Well, think of it this way. And I know it's hard to imagine sometimes with the world that we live in. Your children are a blessing from God. It may not seem like a blessing, but they are a blessing. Also, your wife or your husband was a blessing to their parents, and then God blessed you with that spouse. God loves you, and he wants to bless you continually throughout your life. But see, we have a tendency not to recognize those blessings. We look at the bad instead of knowing the good. The world did the same thing with Christ. The Pharisees and the Sadducees says, we have got to kill this guy. They literally said, the Caiaphas literally said that. He says, this guy must die. Instead, the Jews should have been saying, praise God for the coming of the Savior, coming of the Messiah. Verse 20, 
Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God with all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. The baby was born. The baby came into the earth in the miracle birth, a miracle birth. Verse 21. And when eight days were completed in the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. If you go back over to Luke uh, 1 and 31, you will see that the angel of the Lord came upon Mary and told Mary that you shall name him Jesus before she was even pregnant. Matter of fact, let's just look at Luke 31. Luke 1 and 31, it says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Jesus, which means God saves. Jesus was then presented to the temple. Now when the days of purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought... Joseph and Mary brought him, Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Now, they were in Bethlehem at this time. And in Bethlehem, it's only about five miles. It's only about a five-mile walk. Now, the days of purification is just a couple of weeks that Mary had had her baby, Jesus, and then she walked five miles. Now, maybe she rode a donkey again, but we don't know. But she had to walk five miles to go to the temple to to uh, uphold the laws. Remember when Jesus says, I did not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law? This is one of the laws. He had to be purified. He had to be circumcised. <clears throat> so they came to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it was written in the law of the Lord, every male, every male that opens a womb shall be uh, called holy in the Lord. You can find that in Exodus uh, 13 Verses 1, 12, and 15, and Numbers 3 and 13. It's simply, God is simply saying, every firstborn child, male child, is to be uh, uh, devoted to the Lord. I think there's another word that I can't think of. Not sacrificed, of course, but what? Concentrated, consecrated, cons uh, that word, that word, okay, to the Lord. In other words, shall be given to the Lord. All right? And the offer of sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. Now, what is the significance of this? That is the, the pair of turtle doves and the pigeons are the lowest sacrifice acceptable to the Lord. The lowest sacrifice acceptable to the Lord. Only poor people... That's all they could afford is the lowest sacrificial gift to God, which is a couple of a pair of turtle doves. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Verse 26. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now look at that. The Lord's Christ. Not Christ Jesus, but the Lord's Christ. That means when it, Christ, we've talked about this before. Christ means the anointed one, the chosen one, the sacrificial one, the appointed one. So it is God's chosen one that Simeon is seeing. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him, Jesus, upon his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. Peace on earth. Goodwill towards men. Remember that? This is exactly what Simeon is talking about. He said, in my soul, in my very spirit, I now have peace. This is a profound statement by Simeon because we can understand that once we have seen Jesus, once we have received Jesus, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. 
God is not looking to destroy you. God is not looking to harm you. God is not looking to, to discard you. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. God is looking to be with you throughout your entire life. And with that, we can have a peace. We can have peace. Only the peace that surpasses understanding. Philippians 4. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles. That would be us. To bring revelation to the Gentiles. This is what the candlelight service is about. The candlelight service is the light of God shown through Christ is a light for the Gentiles in order to know God. That is the purpose of Christ is so that we will know God. The light that came into the world, this is what we shared last night, is to show us God in the true nature of God in human form. Over in the book of Colossians, it tells us that Jesus is the full de deity of the invisible God. He is all that God is wrapped up into a man. And that man is Jesus. And Joseph and his mother marveled marveled at those things which he had spoken. Then Simeon blessed them and said to, the Mary, to Mary his mother, Behold, the child is destined to fall for the fall and rise of many in Israel. Because many in Israel, God's chosen people, many would believe and many would not believe. Many would believe and many would not believe. And just like us today, many believe and many will not believe. You're not going to change someone. You're not going to convince someone. You're not going to save someone. That's all God's job. And he's pretty good at it. All we are to do is present the light, plant the seed that God loves them. And that God loves us. And if he loves us, at least me, he can certainly love you. Behold, the child is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel and for a sign, a sign which will be spoken against. What is that sign? That sign is his resurrection. That sign is his resurrection. His rising from the grave and living again, which he is. That is the sign that we look at. We look at the cross and we think, Jesus died for me. Well, yes, that's all great and good that Jesus died for us. But is he still dead and in the grave? Well, certainly not. He rose again. So see, that's even a better sign. Because he lives, we too shall live. John 14, 19. Because he lives, we too shall live. He's not dead in the grave. All the other gods, if you will, of all the other religions, they're dead and in the grave. Muhammad's dead and in the grave. Buddha's dead and in the grave. King David is dead and in the grave. But Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is alive. He is risen in Jesus' name. Amen? He is. He is alive. He's not a dead God. But if Jesus was just Jesus the man, then only I could be with him, or only Robert could be with him, or only David could be with him, or only Brett could be with him. I'm not trying to leave any ladies out, of course. Uh, only God, Jesus could only be in one place at one time. But because he says, I go to the Father, and if I go to the Father, I shall send the Comforter to be with you so that you are never alone. The Holy Spirit can live in each and every one of us. God himself can live in you if you believe. If you believe. Jesus is not dead. Jesus is alive. He is seated at the right hand of the Father in the third heaven. Yes, there's three heavens. That's another teaching. But the Holy Spirit is available to each and every one of us as long as you believe. And for a sign which will be spoken against, yes, a sword, Mary, a sword will pierce through your very soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. 
It will pierce her very soul. Mary stood before the cross and watched her son die. Fully naked, fully beaten beyond recognition, she watched her child that she had wrapped in swaddling clothes. The child that was given to her by God himself that she laid in a manger that the whole world came to praise died. But Mary knew that her baby that she had given birth to would also give life to her. And he did. Let's go back to Matthew 2. Matthew 2. Verse 1. Now again, this is putting it back in chronological order. In Matthew 2, verse 1, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. These were not kings. They were wise men. Now, I'm going to take you here, and you may think, well, we don't believe in astrological signs, and we don't. Matter of fact, if you... Uh, my astrological sign, as people put it, is a, is a Taurus. And then there's Geminis and, and Cancer and whatever the rest of them are. I don't really know. And it doesn't matter. But if you put faith in that, then that's like being a witch or witchcraft. Okay? Don't even read that junk. Okay? It's all man-made. And it's all... Believing in something other than Christ himself. But these particular guys, wise men, were believed to be astrologers. Not that they worshipped the stars, but they felt as though the stars had an arrangement by God in order to send a meaning to us here on the earth. And certainly, they followed one particular bright star, the North Star, which still exists today. Which is still in the, in, in the atmospheres today, and it never moves. It's always there. But they were not practicing any kind of witchcraft or any kind of soothsaying or any of that kind of stuff. They simply saw a star that shined brighter than any other stars, which it still does today. And they followed that star. They were wise men. They were smart. They were not kings. They were not princes. They were not uh, royalty. They were just smart people. They came from the east uh, to Jerusalem saying, Here, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. They knew that there was a special significance there. They didn't try to say, oh, well, he's born as, uh, I'm going to use mine, the sign of the, of the Taurus, and so he's bullheaded. That wouldn't be right, right? Maybe it is with me, but it's not with him. But my point is, they didn't use any of that kind of stuff. They simply knew that that star had a significance, and that star pointed to the King of King and Lord of Lords. When Herod, the king, heard this, he was troubled. Why? Because he didn't want any other kings around. He wanted to be the only king and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered with the chief priests and the scribes and the people together and inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. <clears throat> so they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea. It goes back over to Micah 5 and 2. In Bethlehem of Judea. And thus it was written by the prophet. Here's Micah 5, 2. But you, O Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler whom will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what, that, what time the star appeared, 
he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back the word to me, and that I may come and worship him also. Right. Right. Now, the reason that Herod wanted to know where the child was born, we're going to see in just a little bit. He wanted to kill Jesus right off the bat. The Israelites wanted to kill Jesus because it would take them off of the throne. It would take power away from them. It would take uh, attentiveness from the people away from him. It would take worship away from them. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me, and I may go and worship him also. When they had heard the king, when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, a star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come to the house, when they had come into the house where they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. When they had come to the house. Now growing up, we have all seen the three kings at the manger. He, they did not come to the manger. Now, if this, the, this school program that you see has that, it, it's okay. You know, we don't have to, to uh, what do they call that, um, dissect it. We don't, we don't have to, uh, uh, you know, try to make it as perfect. But we as adults need to know these wise men came to the house of Mary and Joseph, not to the manger, and they came probably, it is believed, about two years after the birth of Jesus. They did not come when Jesus was born. They came about two years later. And we're going to see why in just a minute. <coughs> they came about two years later to see the boy king, Jesus. Verse 11. And when they came to the house, they saw the young child with his mother Mary and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The reason we think that there were three wise men is because there were three gifts presented. It is actually believed that there were probably four or five hundred. It was a caravan that came to worship him. These three wise men had a lot of other friends, if you will, that were wise men as well. And they came to worship the child king, Jesus. But they brought three gifts of significance. And the significance of those gifts are gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The gold is for the royalty of, Je of the Christ child. He is, remember we talked about the lineage of King David. So the gold is, is the present for the king. Frankincense. Frankincense was a incense that was burnt in the temple by the holy priest, the holiest of holy priests, in order to send prayers up to God. So frankincense is the priestlyhood of Christ. And myrrh. Myrrh is a very, very sticky sap that comes from a particular tree. It's very, very hard to find, just like frankincense is very, very hard to find. But myrrh is a very sticky, very fragrant sap. And what it is used for is whenever a person is dying, or when a person has died, they will take and wrap them in the death clothes, or burial garments, or burial clothes, and between each of the layers of clothes, we, t we learned this over whenever Jesus was crucified and he was buried in the uh, grave, they wrapped him in the burial clothes. And between each layer of the clothes, this myrrh was spread. It's very expensive. It's what the alabaster jar contained. When the young lady Mary was, uh, was weeping and crying and washed Jesus' feet, and then she anointed him with myrrh, it was used to keep down the stench of the dead body because it had a very, very powerful, powerful smell. 
So you've got gold for the king, you've got frankincense for the priest, and you've got myrrh representing the death of our Savior. These are the three gifts that were brought by many people to worship the king as a baby. God had put on their hearts this baby. Now we look at our babies whenever they're born, they go, oh yeah, this baby's going to be special. This baby's going to be something else. This baby's going to bless the world. The world's going to be blessed by this baby. We think that, we think that, and then they start growing up, and we go, oh, what happened? But the world knew that this baby, this baby was above all other babies. And so they presented him with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely, war divinely warned in a dream, again, the angel came to them in a dream, that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. <clears throat> now, during this time, Herod was very, very mad, if you will. He was very, very um, ticked off because his intent was to kill this king, as they called him, so that he would remain king. So the angel of the Lord again came to Joseph. He says now, verse 13, Now when they had departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child to his mother and flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek out the young child to destroy him. There's the answer right there. Herod wanted to kill all the children in order to kill Jesus because he did not know where Jesus was because the wise men were wise. When he arose, <clears throat> he took the young child and his mother by night and departed from Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which is spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, out of Egypt I have called my son. Out of Egypt I have called my son. And that's exactly what was prophesied in the Old Testament. Now here's, here's Herod's true meaning of trying to seek out the, the Christ child. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry and sent forth and put to death all male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which had determined from the wise men. Herod killed all the male babies two years and younger in order to try to kill Christ. Is evil new in our world? Not at all. Heinous evil. It is happening over to Croatia right now. There's no reason for that to be even going on over there, but there's evil in our world. And we have to acknowledge that. We have to realize that. A voice was heard in Rama. Lamentations. Rama is another word for, or name for uh, Jerusalem. La uh, lamentations, which is weeping and mourning, and great mourning. Rachel, which again represents Israel. Rachel was Jacob's wife. Jacob, his name was converted to Israel. That actually started the Israelites from uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob, God changed his name to Israel, and from there the Israel nation was born. Prior to that, they were the Hebrews. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. A man, in order to keep his royalty as he thought, in order to keep his status crucified, if you will, or slaughtered all the male children around Bethlehem. Not just in Bethlehem, but around the whole area. Can you imagine how many hundreds of babies were killed? Evil was in the world. How many hundreds of babies does America kill every day, every year? 
hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds, maybe thousands upon thousands. There is evil in the world. I don't care what our government says. It's okay. If you don't want this baby, if this baby's going to be a problem, if this baby's going to cramp your style, same thing Herod said, this baby's going to cramp my style. We got to get rid of him. And so he slaughtered maybe millions. We do the same thing today. We do the same thing today. And our government allows it. Thank goodness, at least we have a governor in this state and a couple of other states who is standing against that. There's a possibility that you might not be here because of that very law. Or I might not be here. There was certainly a possibility that Christ wouldn't be here because Herod killed millions of babies. Maybe, maybe not millions, maybe thousands. I don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us. But the fact is, evil has been in the world and evil is still in our world. And we have to fight against it. We have to fight. Christian brothers and sisters, we have to fight against the evil of the world. If it does not line up with the word of God, if it does not line up with the will of God, if it does not glorify God, then it is evil. And killing babies is evil. Verse 19. Now when Herod was dead, thank goodness. When Herod was dead, behold, and the angel of the Lord appeared to, in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take your child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came to the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus, if it's, that's how you say it, was reigning in, over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream to turn aside, he went to the region of Galilee. Now understand, Judah, Judah is, is down here. And I say down here. But it's, Israel is actually higher in elevation than what Galilee is. Galilee is up here. It would be like Oklahoma and Texas, if you will. Texas is far superior than Oklahoma, so we're up above, right? So a lot of times you'll see in Scripture when they say that they go up to Israel, it simply means they're going up in elevation. Elevation, thank you. I can only think of ev elevation. I don't know. Up in elevation, which means it is, it is a higher plateau or higher uh, in the elevation. But G Galilee is actually like a county, if you will, that is above Judea, which is down here where Israel and Bethlehem are. Nazareth is a town in Galilee. And so instead of going back to Israel... To where this other new king was in Judea, he decides to go, and the angel of the Lord says, No, you go to Galilee. And he came and dwelt in the city called Nazareth, verse 23, that it might fulfill which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. You see, many times people ask, Well, why is Jesus called the Nazarene when he was born in Bethlehem? Why, why is he not called a Bethlehemite or something? It's because of this right here. After he was two years old, his father Joseph, his earthly father Joseph, was directed to go to Galilee and to Nazareth and live there. And therefore he became the Nazarene. <coughs> Christ came as the chosen sacrifice. God's chosen sacrifice. We did not choose him. We did not elect him. We did not say, hey, that guy ought to die for us. God himself chose Jesus. God became a man, Emmanuel, God with us. And that man is Jesus. And that man walked for 33 and a half years on this earth. His ministry only lasted three and a half years. In three and a half years... Jesus changed history. What can you do in your lifetime? 
30, 60, 40, uh, 70, 80, however many years you're going to be here. What can you do? Jesus' work was only three and a half years long. And he changed the world. You can do the same thing. He is the sacrifice chosen by God to pay the price for all the sins of those who will choose to believe in Jesus. Many times I have said the Bible is not for non-believers. The Bible is not for non-believers. The Bible is for believers. The Bible is available to non-believers in hopes that they will read the Bible and come to be a believer. But the blessings of God, the, the, uh, the um, uh, plan of God is for believers. Non-believers are not going to be raptured out of this world. Only believers are going to be raptured out of this world. When Jesus comes back as our Savior to take back his church, to go to heaven, to be with him right before the tribulation period, the seven-year tribulation period, he is going to come back, and he's not going to take every, all the good people out of this world. He's going to come back, and he's going to take the church out of this world. What is the church? The church is the body of Christ, the believers in Jesus Christ. He ain't going to take this building. He's got a much better building up there for us. He is going to take you and me to be with him for eternity and in that we rejoice in the birth of Jesus because if there was no birth there would not have been a death and there would not if there's not a death and a resurrection there would not be a resurrection if there was not a resurrection there would not be an ascension there would not be a savior seated at the right hand of the father there would not be the Holy Spirit in order to show us each and every one of us and to live with each and every one of us and guide each and every one of us to come to know the love that God has for us through that savior Jesus Christ through that baby who was born in a stable took me a long time to get this. It took me a long time to get this. And certainly I'm nowhere I need to be. I've got a long way to go. I thank you for the accolades, but I got a long way to go. But I know that I know that I know. Jesus was born for me. Jesus was born for you because without that birth there would be no salvation I thank Jesus I thank God for the birth of a baby and in that we celebrate in that we celebrate we know December the 25th is not Jesus' birthday. It is believed he was born in the spring sometime. We don't know the day. We do know about the year between 6 and 4 B.C. But because of that birth of that baby, because of the angels of the Lord instructing Mary and Joseph and the shepherds, we know that our Savior lives because he was born of a miraculous birth that only God can do. You yourself are reborn in a miraculous birth that only God does. And I pray that you have been born again. Simeon says in Luke 2, 29 through 32. If I can get back over there. If I were to die today, I would be at peace. Just as Simeon said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. According to your word, my eyes have seen your salvation. My eyes have seen your salvation. I have not visually seen Christ as the man because Christ is seated 
next to the God in the right hand of God in the third heaven. But I have seen with my spiritual eyes, I have seen God working in my life and working in the lives of many of you. So I have seen salvation on this earth. I pray you have seen it. I pray that you know it. Because without that salvation, without the birth of that baby, and you believing in the birth of that baby, you will not see heaven. Remember over in John 3, where Jesus says, it's in, uh, in verse 7, John 3 and 7, it says, you must be born again. Prior to that, he says, you cannot even see the kingdom of God nor can you enter the kingdom of God without knowing Jesus. I pray you know him. I pray you do. I have seen Jesus work in my life, and I've seen Jesus work in many of your lives. We are called to serve God by continuing the work of Christ which is simply for me to show Jenny the Christ that lives in me. For me to show Johnny the Christ that lives in me. For me to show Kathy the Christ that lives in me. Your job is the exact same thing. Your job is the exact same thing. You're to go out into the world and show the light of Christ living in you in hopes, in hopes that they will believe. You don't save. God saves. You can only be the light of Christ. But Woody, we know that you've messed up several times. You better believe I have. And I will probably mess up again. But I know. I know. I don't think, friend. I know that Christ as Philippians 1, 6 says, Christ God will continue the work he has started in me and he will bring it to his fruition because I was created and you were created for his good works. Ephesians 2, 10. You're created for his good works, not yours, for him. Everything else in this whole wide world was created for our enjoyment. But you and I were created for the enjoyment of God. And yet the world still denies him. The world doesn't want to believe. The world doesn't want to accept. And we live in a fallen world. But in that fallen world, you can't be a child of God. It ain't going to be easy. It's going to be tough. Crystal just realized it a little while back. And so today she's going to show you with her public proclamation of her water baptism because Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. She's going to show you that she has Christ living in her. It's already done. Now maybe she, maybe she received Christ whenever we did the sinner's prayer. We're going to do it in just a second. Or maybe a couple seconds. Or maybe it was walking down the road one day. Or maybe it was sitting in her kitchen one day. I don't know when. Because you can receive Christ at any time. All you have to do is listen and hear his voice. And then once you hear his voice, be obedient. Be obedient and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. But you must truly mean it in your heart. You see, God knows your heart. And if you're saying it just to impress somebody else, it doesn't work. If you're saying it because, well, I want to be one of them, it doesn't work. You have to say it because you want God in your life. You must truly mean it in your heart. But God makes it so very simple. So very simple. So let's ask God. Let's talk to God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Lord, so much for what God has given me, which is life itself. 
I say that all the time, but I truly mean that, Lord, because I now have the best life I've ever had. And I want you to know, friends, that that life is available to you, a life of living for Christ. Not a life of living around Christ or, or uh, you know, a life living for Christ. But you have to truly want that. You have to desire it in your heart. And if that be you today, if that's the case with you today, and you have not received Jesus as Lord and Savior, just simply talk to God. That's prayer. Talk to God. And say, dear Jesus, I've been away so long. I've been so far. And I have finally learned that it's not about me, it's about you. But it's also about you living through me. And Father, I desire that. I desire to have Jesus in me. I ask you, Lord, to come into my life, be my Lord, be my Savior, and I shall live for you from this day forward. Guide me and direct me as your word says you will. Be a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet so I may walk worthy of serving you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you said that prayer for the first time, then Scripture tells us, yeah, thank you. Then Scripture tells us that you're now, if you truly said that, truly meant that in your heart, Scripture says that now you are born again. You are that new creation. You have Christ living in you. Now it is time to take Christ to all those out there. Not in here. All those out there. And I pray it be so in your life. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to sit down like I talked about and scrunch your knees up and, and move uh, all the way forward. As, as far forward as you can. Okay? All right. All right. So go ahead and, and have a seat. What, what's your turn, Blue? Okay. We got you. You got to go all the way down, babe. Sorry. Okay. Put your knee up in front of you. No, put it in front of you. Leg up in front of you. You got to squat down. Just like that. All the way down. You mean put, you mean to push you? No. <laughs> Just one quick swoosh and you'll be in. All right. There you are. All right, Crystal, is it by your own confession that you've uh, chosen to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? <laughs> yes. Okay, then it's my privilege and honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're going to go all the way down and right back up. One, two, three. There we go. You all right? Okay. Now, not too quick. Give me that blue one, please. All right, you okay? All right, this is yours to keep. There you go. All right, now, when you come out, you're just going to take it easy, take it slow, and come out. And let us help you. <laughs> you ought to be ready to get out now. <laughs> Give me a hand. There you go. There you go. All right, now, come on out. We got you. Come on. There you go. Now, step down off of there. There you go. Just like that. Just like that. There you go. All right, now, hand me that other one as well. Here's your two towels to take back with you to dry off. Okay? That blue one you keep. Yeah. And then get your shoes. Bye. <laughs> All right. Now, before you take off and go to the back, once you get those on, I want to welcome you into the family of God. Amen. God bless you.